Have you decorated for Christmas yet? I have to admit, I've been a bit of a Scrooge this year. It's not because I have a bah humbug attitude or I don't want to spend money on decorations. I'm just a no Christmas until after Thanksgiving person. My family has always put up our tree on or around Thanksgiving Day. It's a tra tradition that Kylie and I have always agreed on until this year. Kylie has been ready to get a Christmas tree for weeks now. Last year, we couldn't have one while we were traveling. All we had was a small Charlie Brown tree that we kept on the counter in our camper. So this year, Kylie wants extra Christmas. We have to make up for all the bells and smells that we missed out on last year. Both of us are ready for Christmas to restart the traditions we couldn't celebrate last year. One of my favorite traditions is the Barksdale family Christmas party. This is the side of my family that goes over the top with everything. It's go big or go home, especially for Christmas. The food is mostly the same every year, appetizers and soup with a few favorites like buffalo chicken dip and Oreo balls that never change. After we eat, we gather in the living room with all the kids around the Christmas tree. My uncle Drex passes out slips of paper to the adults with sections of the night before Christmas printed on them. He talks about the birth of Jesus and the reason that we're all gathered to celebrate with all the kids. And he starts off reading the night before Christmas. We go around the room and finally we stop to listen for jingle bells at the end of the story because yes, Santa Claus comes to our family Christmas party. It usually takes a few Christmas carols before Santa makes his grand entrance with gifts for everyone. It's the same pattern every year. It helps me prepare for Christmas. It makes me feel at home. The familiar stories, the love of family, it gives me hope. I know that I belong there. I know that next year we will come together again to celebrate our love for one another and to anticipate the birth of Jesus. The Christmas season is full of magic, but that magic doesn't appear every year. Sometimes we're left waiting for it to show up. Sometimes we aren't able to gather with our families. Sometimes we get lost in the chaos of parties and presents and traffic and waiting for gifts to be delivered, scrambling to find just that right thing for everyone. Maybe some of us this year are hopelessly waiting for Taylor Swift tickets. But in our scripture today, the people of Israel are impatiently waiting. They are so impatient that they've begun to complain to God, asking why he hasn't shown up. They've been exiled from their homeland for 50 years, hoping that they would see God's promise of a new Jerusalem in their lifetime. They finally return to the land, but things aren't going how they had hoped. We pick up in chapter 58, verse 1 through 9 in Isaiah. Shout out, do not hold back. Lift up your voices like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers." Look, you fast only to quarrel and fight and to strike with a wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is not this the fast that I choose, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house, when you see the naked, to cover them, and not to hide yourself from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly." Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help and he will say, here I am. The good news according to Isaiah. Thanks be to God. 
It can be difficult to figure out how to order your life. Being a young adult, everyone has an opinion on what you should and should not be doing, what your career should look like, how your family should function. And now that Kylie and I are expecting our first child, people are quick to give us advice. Things like sleep while the baby sleeps, which may be true in a sense, but we'll also have lots of things to do like clean the house or do the laundry or cook or a long list of other things. Parenting is a daunting task, as we will soon find out, especially when you're still trying to figure out who you are in the world and how you fit in. I must admit that this time of year, being confronted with characters like Ebenezer Scrooge doesn't always help. When the ghost of Christmas past comes to visit him, we see how his hard, unloving father and the loneliness of Scrooge's childhood created this desire to become wealthy, which leads to his obsession with money and his harshness towards others. Now, my child isn't going to have to worry about uh, growing up with an unloving father or being left in a boarding school all alone. But you know how easy it is to spiral into these what-if worst-case scenarios. The people of Israel had been telling their stories of this hopeful return to their homeland for 50 years. They've celebrated their traditions. They've dreamed of returning home and living in the kingdom of God on earth that the prophet Isaiah has promised them. Now the time has come to make it a reality. They're back in their land, but the magic of their traditions and their stories, it it hasn't shown up in their real life. Things aren't falling into place as they thought they would. I imagine they're a little disoriented, weighed down by the violence of exile. They're making a mess of things. Instead of living into the fullness and freedom of God's love and grace, they are chained to their fears and anxieties, trying to ensure their own security over anything else. The people sit in sackcloth and ashes and they fast waiting for God to show up and do it for them. Do you know what Ebenezer means? It means stone of help. See, in 1 Samuel, God helps the Israelites defeat the Philistines and Samuel puts down a stone on the ground that he calls Ebenezer to memorialize that God gave the help that God gave them. What help has God given you? How do you remember it and memorialize it? Ebenezer Scrooge was helped by his friend, his partner, Jacob Marley, when he comes to him and he says this. But my friends, you were not unfeeling towards your fellow men. True, there was something about mankind we loved. I think it was their money. (laughs) Doom Scrooge. You're doomed for all time. Your future is a horror story written by your crime. Your chains are forced by what you say and do. So now you're fine when life is done. A nightmare waits for you. <laughs> what are these terrible chains? Oh, the chains. We forge these chains in life by our acts of greed. You wear such a chain yourself. Humbug. Speak comfort to me, friends. Comfort! Your chains are formed by what you say and do. Now, if you're Kirk Cousins or Taylor Heineke, other people give you their chains after a win on Sundays. But for the rest of us, I wonder what our chains look like. In the original story by Charles Dickens, Marley says, I wear the chains I forged in life. I made it link by link and yard by yard. I girded it on my own free will and of my own free will I wore it. Marley and Scrooge, like him, chose to live a life focused on their own success and wealth, not caring about the people who helped them get there. Did you know that the rolling suitcase wasn't invented until the 1970s? Now, there are a few examples of people making their own decades before this, but it wasn't officially invented until Bernard Sadow unscrewed four casters from a wardrobe and fixed them to a suitcase in 1970. He was an American luggage executive, but even when his 
with his position in the industry and the patent that he secured in 1972, he couldn't convince people to invest in his idea. Do you know why? Because it wasn't manly. I'm not kidding. Men wouldn't roll a suitcase because it was simply unmanly to do so. Women wouldn't either because it was expected that their husband or whatever man they were traveling with would carry their suitcase for them. It took 15 years before wheeled suitcases became widely used. Nobel Prize winning economist Robert Schiller says it's an example of how the blindingly obvious can stare us expectantly in the face for an eternity. It was obvious that wheels on your suitcase would make carrying your luggage easier, but people refused to accept the help. It's a common problem. We don't like accepting help. I worked uh, while I was in college at First Presbyterian Church in LaGrange. We were having an event one afternoon after church and my boss, Emily, needed to find a specific person. She was busy with other tasks, so I volunteered to go and find this lady for her. The only problem was I had no idea what she looked like. I knew her name, I knew where she was supposed to be, and that was it. I hoped she would be in this spot with a name tag on so that I could identify her. But when I got to that spot, there were two women there. Neither of them had name tags on and neither of them were the person I was looking for. I wandered around for a while hoping I would get lucky and find her instead of just stopping and asking for help. Now, this is a funny example, but there are bigger problems that we try to fix ourselves. Sometimes we have to hit rock bottom before we have to come to the end of ourselves, before we finally realize we can't do this alone. Or maybe you do accept help, and instead of just giving thanks and accepting the free gift of help, we continue to carry our help stones. Instead of setting them down in thanksgiving as Samuel did, we carry them around as a record until we can pay off our debt. I wonder what kind of stone Samuel used for this Ebenezer. Was it a small stone like the one that David used to defeat Goliath or a large stone? Something that could, have, could be used as a cornerstone. No matter how large it is, the longer you carry it, the heavier it gets. The more stones you collect, the more you are weighed down. The gift of our faith is that we are carried God shoulders our burdens with us. God breaks the chains that bind us and frees us for lives of love and joy. But sometimes, instead of putting down our Ebenezer and accepting this gift, we carry it with us as if it's a debt to be repaid. Father Greg Boyle of Homeboy Industries got invited to speak at his alma mater, Gonzaga University. He always takes homies with him when he can, and homies are what they call the men and women in their program. On this particular trip, he took Mario. Of all the people he has worked with, he says that Mario is the most tattooed of them all. He even has tattoos on his eyelids. As they walk through the airport, Father Boyle watches as women clutch their purses tighter and parents pull their children close as Mario passes by. He says, if, anyone at, if you ask anyone at Homeboy who the kindest, gentlest person that works there is, they wouldn't say that it was him. They would say Mario. The three of them finally get to the gate and Mario is so nervous that he's hyperventilating and puts his head between his knees. They finally get to Gonzaga and each one of the homies tell a PG version of their story and Father Boyle gives his speech. But at the end of the night, there was a question and answer session. The first question was for Mario. A woman came to the microphone and said, you say you're a father and your son and daughter are starting to reach their teenage years. What advice do you give them? Mario nervously clutched the microphone and retreated back into himself. He closed his eyes and suddenly he blurted out, I just, I just don't want my kids to turn out to be like me. Mario stood on the stage with his 
face in his hands, sobbing, and the woman who asked the question stood back up. As she cried, she pointed at Mario and said, You are gentle, you are kind, you are loving, you are wise. I hope your kids turn out to be just like you. And all 1,000 people in the audience stood and cheered as Mario cried on stage. Even though Mario had turned his life around, he was a loving father. He had taken care of his family. He hadn't freed himself from the chains that held him back. He was carrying around the weight of his past and living in fear that his children might repeat his mistakes. He wasn't able to fully live in, into a hopeful, hopeful future in which he had been freed from his chains. It took a perfect stranger in a room of a thousand people to return him to himself, to reflect the love of God back at him and allow Mario to put down his Ebenezer. God was with the people of Israel the whole time. He was out on the margins with the least, the last, and the lost, calling the people of God to come and put down their Ebenezer, to unlock the chains that were binding them, to face their pain so that they might live into the hope they had talked about for generations. At the end of A Christmas Carol, Scrooge goes to his nephew Fred's house from Christmas, for Christmas dinner. He knocks on the door and he asks if they will allow him in. And the original story says this, let him in. It's a mercy he didn't shake his arm off. He was at home in five minutes. Nothing could be heartier. His niece looked just the same. So did Topper when he came. So did the plump sister when she came. So did everyone when they came. Wonderful party, wonderful games, wonderful unanimity, wonderful happiness. Whatever your chains are, whatever stones you are carrying, God is calling you to put down your Ebenezer. God is offering you the key of hope to unlock your chains this day so that we might begin to live into the hope of the kingdom of God. No matter the exile we experience, God is always ready to carry us home. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.